Hey guys, welcome back to Tarot Tactics FPL. It's Fran here, and I'm back with the Game Week 11 cheat sheet. As you guys do know, there's going to be a Game Week 12 blank between Arsenal and City, so do keep that in mind with your transfers. It really does depend on your team climate. Obviously, Arsenal have a great fixture in Game Week 11. City, less so, I would say, from the defensive point of view, but obviously still very good for Game Week 11, um, just because they're actually simply playing, and the Liverpool defense have been quite poor. And you have to think about your transfers there, right? You want to think about whether Foden and Martin are these kind of players who are, I would say, on, on the periphery of being transferred, whether they have enough a team value to actually be able to be kept. And in my opinion, I actually think, for example, if you're if you're the type of owner who owns someone like Foden, Martinelli, Cancelo, and Haaland, you should actually probably keep all of these assets and then actually just admit that you'd like to take a blank and, and play with 10 players in Game Week 12. That's actually preferred, in my opinion, than actually losing the team value in Foden and then actually forcing the transfer back in when he still looks fantastic and... Honestly, the team value is probably worth it because we also have such a close impending wild card that maybe that, that team value is actually quite useful. As far as the actual team, though, in terms of midfielders, you have Pereira who does rise to the top. I do think this is simply because Willock is actually a worse option than Amiron. We talked about this last week where Willock obviously has similar expected goal involvements when you compare the, the two, but actually Almiron is the one who actually has better expected goals. And we actually saw that once again bear, bear out with another great performance from Almiron in Newcastle. He's probably going to actually simply be one of the best options going forwards as a budget player, probably a little bit better than someone like Pereira. Obviously, Pereira scoring does make him a completely different option. I don't think a lot of people expect it for him to be able to score an open play. That was cer cer certainly something that I wasn't expecting myself. And I do think when Mitrovic comes back, he probably will take some more, I would say, less advanced positions. He's probably going to take more wing positions, and he's not very, I would say, nailed on to score, simply because this Fulham team does play around Mitrovic quite well. And we'll see that a lot of players do get involved in the Fulham play, but no one, when you look at the underlying statistics, is really uh, a focal point outside of Mitrovic. So simply put, Pereira is still someone you should actually keep on your bench for most weeks, and, and hope, obviously, that he excels when, let's say, you have an injury or so on and so forth. As far as Bailey, he does drop because of the injury issue. I should have put an asterisk on Bailey as well, um, but I think his injury issue isn't necessarily long-term, so he might be able to come back to play, but of course the minutes will be managed as well, and he doesn't have great fixtures. Almiron does rise to the top, as previously mentioned. I think it's simply because he is the more interesting goal threat, and he's also nailed down his position, right? Especially in a time period where there are still some more injuries in the Newcastle squad, and he's actually performing at a very high level right now. As far as Eze, he also is doing much of the same. Patrick Vieira has been very, very complimentary of him in his press conferences, also talking specifically about how many uh, attacking and advanced positions he can occupy on the pitch. And you also see that someone like Olise, who I would say is a little bit more of an assistive asset, is also there in this kind of cheat sheet. And that's the kind of difference between the two. I think Eze is someone that I actually previously thought is more of a creative player, but we can now see that he's also taking more advanced positions. The underlying numbers obviously still fall far away from Zaha, so I wouldn't say that as a is of course a comparable option or very good side grade away from Zaha but if you are looking for someone to fill in that kind of gap in your team that was previously occupied by someone like a Gordon or a Gray then maybe as is actually quite an interesting option to to work with for these recent weeks no changes other than Gordon Gray and Sochek dropping to the bottom of the list I think that's simply just because West Ham do have some tough games and still Sochek hasn't really shown much I think you are still for example gambling on specifically good games for him to score corners and it still kind of goes counter to my logic of picking players right it's really hard to pick players who score for example like James Ward-Prowse outside of open play rather than someone who scores in 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 set piece plays and that's the difference right you don't really have the guarantee that someone who scores frequently from set piece plays is going to do so versus a weaker team whereas there's probably more of a guarantee that someone who scores in open play will do so versus a weaker team uh Gordon Gray they just drop simply because I think Everton's fixtures are quite tough and we're also seeing that for example there's other options like it will be who are getting involved and simply put the underlying numbers just aren't good enough I don't think this Everton team is particularly creative they are very very good at grinding teams down playing quite defensively for around 90 minutes and that just doesn't really lend anything towards Gordon Gray who I would say probably are, are much worse than some of the other options here in Crystal Palace and Newcastle who probably have better attacks as far as 6.0 6.9 options you do have Martinelli and Trossard still at the top no changes there Rodrigo is still at a second tier option for me you could argue that he should drop to a third tier option but I still think because of the you know the sinister red and also because Bamford hasn't really found form and him actually starting consistent in that center forward position that he still actually is a very good value option and specifically when he comes into that kind of Leicester and Fulham fixture that he could be a very interesting differential if you do tend to go that way Rashford of course is still an interesting option I've actually listed that Newcastle should be a green fixture simply because I think this United team have actually g gone to a point where they are consistently able to score. Potentially, of course, you could argue that they're very good at breaking down uh, teams that are progressively playing versus them, but their, their performance versus Everton was actually quite positive 
uh, when we consider what happens when they play versus a low block. So I was quite in, uh, interested in that. Also, keep in mind that Rashford actually probably should have scored a goal. Not really going to debate the call in terms of the penalty, uh, sorry, the handball, sorry. But um, I do think Rashford is still looking like a good option open play, at least in terms of his finishing and overall kind of attributes this season. It's definitely taken a step up from the previous year. And he just simply has much more confidence th than the last year, where I don't think he was even occupying very good positions inside the box to even be able to score. As far as Barnes, he does drop for me. I think simply the eye test, even though he's already had two good fixtures for now, don't really bear out that he's a good asset. Of course, you, you could rely on him to score, let's say, a banger outside the box, which is probably his main way of scoring right now. But no, not much of the attack actually flows through him. I much prefer Pats and Daka as a second option, even though Daka has managed minutes. And that's kind of the situation right now with Barnes. His underlying numbers don't really stick out that much. Whereas someone like Paqueta, who I think is someone that Moyes was kind of waiting to get more integrated into the team and has found a little bit of form now, I do think he's someone who's trending up, whereas Barnes is someone who's sort of trending down. Remember as well that Brendan Rodgers did at, at, at some points in the season also rotate Barnes, especially when he wasn't in form. And that's, I think, the difference between these two assets. They're kind of trending in different directions, but still probably not really assets that you'd like to prioritize because you have players like Bowen, you have players like Madison who are simply better. Zaha, Bernardo, Anthony, no changes there in this sort of tier. I think Bernardo and Anthony have been fantastic, still taking along. Bernardo potentially is not really an option to think about. He might even go into a third option, especially since we would like to reserve that third city spot for Foden in the near future, unless you are a Kevin De Bruyne owner or even someone who like who wants to go straight back into city defense. Uh, but Anthony, for me, has looked incredible. And I think, obviously, um, a lot was talked about with that kind of false goals quote that he's very one-dimensional, but I think he's shown so much already in, in multiple different pictures and different matchups so far. He's a very creative player, and I think his eye for the game is, is, is very, very interesting. A little bit sad as well that Anthony Marshall himself was injured. Uh, he was quite essential for that kind of goal contribution and that kind of assist. But I think Anthony will do fine without Marshall as well. And we've already seen him do incredibly well in some of the tougher games. So as obviously United have a little bit of a mix of, of good and bad games, I do think that this is an opportunity here to bank on someone like Anthony, who is playing for a team, I would say, that are a little bit fixture-proof in a sense in terms of their ability to score goals. Because we can see, for example, even in a game where they got crushed by City, uh, they're still capable of scoring goals, especially in the second half when things go poorly. So I, I do like the kind of change in United where I think it is worth investing into their attack this season. Looking into the second portion, the midfielder specifically, the more premium tier assets, I think Saka does actually rise to the top. And the big reason simply isn't because we had an electric performance versus Liverpool, but I actually I think the boost simply is because he is now that kind of recognized penalty taker. We previously did ask the question whether it was Martin or Saka that would take penalties when someone else drew the penalty. And in this situation, Jesus actually drew the penalty and Saka took the penalty. So I think this is the first instance, unless I'm incorrect, and obviously feel free to incorrect me, um, sorry, to correct me in the comments, but... I do think this is the first opportunity where this has happened and, and Saka actually took the penalty. So that already immediately boosts him as an option. And we did talk about in the past about Martin Lieber Saka, but actually if you look at the underlying stats, now Saka is now turning back into a direction where his expected goal numbers are actually increasingly high. Martin Lee, of course, has extremely high expected assists that I think also makes him much better than Saka as a pure option. But that's not necessarily a problem, right? Because we always say that you have to treat assets isolated uh, in an isolated manner. Sorry, and Martin Lee, of course, probably still is a top two, top three asset uh, even including the blank in FPL. So that doesn't mean Saka's a bad option. I think simply if you can find a way to, let's say, even incorporate something like five midfielders, then you could try to do that, right? Bring Saka and Foden into your team. But obviously, if I had to pick one between the two, I think I'd probably go with Foden even after the blank, um, even though Saka technically lands on a slightly better run. You know, that, that Southampton game is probably better than Brighton, to be honest. But yeah, I think Saka being a penalty taker is a huge change to how we evaluate Arsenal assets in the future. As far as Mount, he also gets a rise. Just a very interesting performance versus Wolves. And it was nice to see that actually he's able to play consistently 90 minutes in both effectively what is the Chelsea A and B team. So I think he's one of these options where on the eye test, he's actually looking quite positive. And with, uh, with Potter, hopefully we'll also see that Mount becomes a mainstay in the squad. And, and I think the, the nice thing about Mount too is that he probably is going to be a little bit more fixture-proof uh, and rotation-proof than some of the other Chelsea assets in the attacking positions because we might even see in the future more rest for Sterling, more rest for Aubameyang. I'd probably say less so for Sterling because I think his fitness levels are actually very, very high traditionally. So I think Sterling, the reason why I haven't dropped him specifically is because I do expect him to actually play most of the games, especially now that they're in a good position in the Champions League. And there aren't necessarily as many easy fixtures 
uh, in Chelsea's way after, let's say, Aston Villa and Brentford, because the, the run after that is, I would say, quite tough. There's a lot of mid-table teams there, United as well. So Chelsea do probably re require, I would say, Sterling. And, and Sterling will probably be quite an appealing asset alongside Aubameyang, even if they have some tougher fixtures, because we are seeing actually a much more improved Chelsea team overall. As far as De Bruyne, still a top option for me. I don't really want to evaluate De Bruyne as a bad option because Foden is a much more appealing third piece, but that might have to happen, let's say, as soon as Game Week 13. We'll make a decision there, I think, and I'll probably uh, elaborate on the cheat sheet why, uh, as to why, for example, De Bruyne and Bernardo might not be top options. Salah and Son still remain as second-tier options. I just think because Son is an interesting pivot away from De Bruyne that he still remains quite an interesting option. I know a lot of people are, are not sold on Salah, but especially with the Reese James injury, if it does turn out to be quite bad, I do think we have a place for Salah in our teams, especially with a great run of games such as West Ham, Donning Forest and Leeds. But a lot of us might be questioning why even go to Salah when you can maybe go into a forward instead. And I think that's obviously a very, very reasonable argument. So if you're kind of arguing along that lens, I think that's perfectly fine. And maybe Salah does deserve to be a tier three option at this point. But I'm not saying necessarily that Salah is a tier one anyway. So you'd probably consider other assets before him uh, for now. And that's kind of my opinion on, on, on Salah and the premiums as well. In terms of the forwards, we're actually seeing a lot of changes this week, both in the budget options and also the top tier options, simply because I think a lot more options have actually come into the game and have exposed themselves as decent options now to pick. In terms of the budget options, I think the reason why these have all risen is because there is an opportunity now to move into a budget forward. We have previously embraced, I would say, a three forward model, especially for people who are moving into a game week eight slash nine wildcard. Those sorts of players were looking to go for something like a Jesus type position player and then a Mitrovic and then a Holland, right? Uh, but some people have also embraced Kane and Holland as well. But you might also want to move into a budget forward, specifically if Mitrovic's injury uh, situation isn't really ironed out. He's also, I think, subject to having two price rises and uh, price falls sorry, in the last two weeks. So that's actually changed the dynamic of things. I think a lot of people are forcing transfers out of Mitrovic. Solanke for me is one of the most interesting options, compares as one of those budget options. And I think the simple reason is because he is playing 90 minutes, he is nailed on pens. That's not something that I can say for any of the other options. Welbeck sort of falls out because I think he's been historically quite unclinical, does play for a top team that does create chances. But I think, as I said, isn't on penalties as well. That's something that McAllister shares and that's not really a huge plus for him as a player. Whereas Edouard and Daka probably pass the eye test a little bit more. I would say Daka is actually the option that I prefer, but I do think that Edouard actually has a much cleaner run of fixtures, at least for the time being. Simply put, I think Patrick Vieira is someone who seems to back players who are in form. Edouard is someone who is clearly in form, whereas Daka as well. I think there is still more of a chance that, let's say, you have games where Vardy will come in and start, even though Daka has been showing exceptional form. So I think that's the main difference there. But they're all very close as options. I think Welbeck, potentially, a lot of people will shy away from because there's a better option in Trossard from the same team. With with Leicester, of course, I'm not sure if whether teams whether actually want to double up on the Leicester attack, but Daka is there as an option. Uh, Edouard as well might be interesting as coverage because I think not everyone has embraced moving into Zaha, right? A lot of people still own assets like Bowen and Madison as well, as opposed to Zaha. And maybe you could actually embrace Crystal Palace by going for someone like Edouard as well, especially when Eze is also an option. Welbeck for me, as I said, is probably a pass, and Solanke still passes the eye test for me, at least for the part of how he is able to operate in easier matchups. Fulham is such a poor defense that I think Solanke is going to have a field day there, probably hopefully finally score a goal, not against Nottingham Forest there. Um, maybe a little bit of bias, of course, I do own Solanke as an asset, but I do think that especially the, the effect and, and the... Uh, importance of playing around 89 minutes, 90 minutes per match, it was shown in that match, right? Daka was substituted off at 66 minutes. Then Solanke gets a double assist at 67 minutes plus. So that's kind of the benefit, of course, when you're a striker and you're playing consistently for a team and playing the full 90 minutes. That's something that Edouard and Daka can't share. As far as Wilson, he does rise to a top as an option. I know a lot of people don't really like moving into Wilson because he is very injury prone. And we saw exactly that with Anthony Marshall this week. Someone who has been historically injury prone finds a starting spot on the team again and then just immediately gets injured. That's very, very tough. Wilson, of course, I understand why people don't want to embrace him as an option. But I don't think that Wilson and Tony's fixtures are really, really different. I think Brentford actually have fallen off quite a bit, and we also need to regard Newcastle as a top team. So even though they have some tough matchups, we've also, we've also seen that Wilson has historically been able to score versus tough teams. I think that Tottenham game is going to be very tough because Tottenham are very, very good defensively. United, not so, specifically because of the injury issues that they've suffered lately. So I think Wilson has a great opportunity to just really score heading towards the World Cup, and he has a great run of games. Uh, Jesus and Firmino both rise. I think simply that's because Liverpool do look quite interesting in the 4-4-2. Their attacking, sorry, their attacking options are still very interesting in FPL. I think we have to consider that the Liverpool defense is probably going to be a skip for now. 
but the attack is still exceptional, right? When you look at the expected numbers, when you also look at how frequently they're able to score, how they're able to score versus Arsenal as well, so easily on, on the break at times, it does show that Firmino, Jota, and Darwin are all options. Jota is not on this list for now, but I do think Darwin actually does rise as well as a top option. Darwin for me is a little bit more interesting because he does hold that position in the box so much more. And in this time where Luis Diaz is injured and if Liverpool are to maintain this kind of 4-4-2 formation, I do think it might be more interesting to actually go for Darwin for now. He's someone who really is um, hogging all the kind of attacking options and he is quite clinical at times. So it's really a question of whether you believe in Darwin's form, whether he's able to, to find consistency. Jota, of course, made a kind of interview today as well, speaking about Darwin's, uh, I think, his ability to kind of integrate into the squad, find a little bit of form, especially after he had a, such a hot start on Community Shield, then actually cooled off, especially with the red card. Now we're actually seeing that Darwin is getting consistent starts, and I think that's a hugely positive sign on whether you'd like to embrace Darwin as soon as game week 12. So therefore he rises. Aubameyang, a little bit of a question mark for me. I think he actually has such a great run of fixtures, and he probably does actually start going forwards. But for me, the the main concern, of course, is, is whether or not he's actually going to get consistent starts and whether he's going to get managed, because he is one of the older players in the squad, and, and potentially Potter might be a little bit more keen and actually getting Chelsea into a better Champions League position, being able to qualify out of that group in first place with the two back-to-back -back wins that they've had in Champions League. Maybe that things will change, the prior priorities will change, which will allow for Aubameyang to play more minutes in the league. But that, I think, is still a wait and see. As far as Ronaldo, he does rise as a top option. And I think Kane seemingly just has a knock, so he should be able to play. He actually confirmed that as well in the post-match interview. And such, such a great fixture versus Everton, but potentially not a captaincy option, especially with the uh, injury concern there. But Ronaldo does actually find himself on the cheat sheet once again. I, would I go into Ronaldo right now? Probably not. But he, he, he looks like someone who I would say is still capable of providing consistently great performances. He really hasn't really found too much form as of late. Uh, and I think he's still more of a wait and see for me because United have such a great run of games starting from game week 14. If it's ever the time to go Ronaldo, I think it's then as opposed to now. I would actually wait for him to accumulate a bit of form before I actually head into him since the Tottenham game and the Chelsea game are such tough fixtures. In terms of the defensive positions, the only real change is, I think, just simply the move of Duncan Webster towards the top position and potentially also I could consider that Mings is someone that should drop with his Aston Villa team. They do have some tough fixtures, but I still think great games in, in game weeks 12 and 13. Potentially, they don't cover the gaps um, so well in terms of positions, but I think they have been holding up as a very, very good defense. Uh, Duncan Webster, though, on the other hand, have just perfect fixtures, I think, for 11 and 12. These are essential fixtures because we're expecting that the James injury might be short term. Same for Trent. Uh, so if you'd like to, let's say, embrace someone like Trent in game week 13, go, go back into James or keep James in your team. Hopefully he returns for the game week 12. Duncan Webster still present as great options, right? Even if you, let's say, need James and, and you might consider him back at 14. Obviously, it really just depends on the injury kind of verdict from Potter and, and also the Chelsea kind of medical stuff. But I would say Duncan Webster are perfect options to really cover the short term gap for FPL. They have great fixtures there. Uh, Gwei, he and Anderson obviously do seemingly have a great run of fixtures, but I think Crystal Palace have been playing much more attacking this season. I think it's very evident that that's the case. Um, so whether they actually are able to keep clean sheets is a different story because we have mentioned that their underlying stats this season are a little bit poor from a defensive point of view than ever before. So that's going to be the main difference there where I would say because their fixtures are so clean, it still makes sense to actually probably have, you know, a fourth and fifth defender, right? You might want to have Dunk. You might also want to top that up with Gwei. So it's not like you need to necessarily pick one from Aston Villa from Brighton and, and from Crystal Palace potentially you could have two out of three as far as the other options not so interesting because they don't really cover the gap so well obviously Zuma does have independently good games West Ham have been quite defensive Dalo, I would say a little bit of a weakness because this United team is suffering from injuries but I think on, on his day especially when United keep a clean sheet he is al almost certainly going to be a bonus magnet and Justin I think this Leicester team much much poorer defensively than any of the other teams fixtures do get slightly more worse than Crystal Palace in the, in the short term and yeah as I said with Saliba Someone to probably think about immediately as soon as game week 13, 14 rolls around. And Wolves defense, we just still haven't really seen much from them lately. As far as Trent and Perisic, obviously these two options drop. Trent could actually easily drop into the avoid territory. For Perisic, this is an interesting one. I've dropped him because I think there is a concern with minutes here. Uh, and also potentially with overall performances of, of him in general. But he does have a great fixture here in game week 11 where you could see him as an immediate transfer away from James if it seems like the James injury verdict is quite poor. Perisic could probably start versus the Everton uh, versus Everton sorry and I mean Dyer as well could cover quite well if you're a little bit uncertain about Perisic minutes because obviously Dyer does play 90 minutes 
full on throughout. Perisic, though, has that kind of upside where I think simply if he's able to start the fixture for Severton, he could have such a magnificent haul. And that's kind of the double edged sword of Perisic. I think, especially when you're looking at Gaming 12, you're looking for a defender to replace James, you also want them to cover the Gaming 12 blank where seemingly you'll probably have three to four players on your bench who are unable to play. So, yes, I can see the hesitancy to move towards the Tottenham defense in Game Week 11. But I think if, if you're simply just looking at the expected value, specifically considering that we have so few options on defense, I do think Paris is one to think about this week. But overall, because of the rotation issues, I would say so far, and also Dorothy uh, coming and acclimating back to that right back position, Ryan Sassion still playing overall quite well. I do think there's a potential here for Perisic to be a great option as a kind of one week, one game week punt, right? So that's kind of what, why Perisic drops over on the cheat sheet, but still a great option for Everton if you guys want to think about that. In terms of the goalkeepers, I would say maybe Guaita does deserve potentially a fall, but also I, when, when I look at the 4.5 keepers and, and that sort of position, there just really aren't many good options whatsoever, right? So we're in a situation where I would say even when you're looking at Pope and looking for downgrades from Pope, there just doesn't seem to be a top option that's sneaking out as the you know the kind of MVP goal pick uh goalkeeper pick for the, for the near future and of course a lot of people have been talking about Martinez as well from Aston Villa I still just think that you should just go for Mings if you want coverage of Aston Villa they also don't have great fixtures themselves so I think it doesn't really make sense to move into Martinez for now Sa has been someone who consistently I think makes a lot of saves as a keeper and he's an interesting option alongside Pope but of course a little bit more expensive but I think really the only rise this week belongs to Kepa, right? He is someone who's played a lot of fixtures. We do know that Mendy has been sitting on the bench, but also has been recuperating from an injury. And maybe at any time we'll see Potter rotate. But Kepa has actually been able to lock down the spot. He's actually gotten a few clean sheets so far. So I do think Kepa is actually an interesting option to move into. He's only at 4.4 and potentially a worthwhile move if you'd like to downgrade a keeper. And specifically, if you already have Ward as your second keeper, because if you have Ward as your second keeper, it's a very easy move to make into Kepa because worst case scenario, okay, you probably lose 0.3 on value when it comes to the overall makeup of your team, but there could be so much more of an upside by going for Kepa in the short term. And he's exactly what Fofana could have been for us in our team. So I do really like the Kepa potential punt there. Uh, but otherwise, Leno and Henderson, they do have to absolutely drop. These are two teams with the worst defensive statistics. Obviously, Nottingham Forest have a much worse run. Fulham have a seemingly still a green run, but I just don't think they're really capable of keeping a clean sheet whatsoever, the two teams between them. Whereas with Mesley and Pickford, I think you're kind of rolling a dice, right? Every three weeks, I think there's a potential for them to keep a clean sheet, maybe even every four. And in that week specifically, they could make a ton of saves, could get you 11 to 12 points in that fixture. Otherwise, they're kind of binary picks, right? Zero to one points every week. But at least there's the upside there. But the other picks, of course, were kind of, trying to take a chance more on consistency more on clean sheets but that's really it for this week pope does also drop into a second tier option specifically with that united game rolling up i think it's an interesting opportunity to actually make a transfer away from pope but because of the reese james injury and us probably having to deal with more pressing issues maybe you'd like to avoid that transfer this week and allison falls because of the Liverpool defense still shambolic um so thank you guys so much for watching and i'll see you guys in the next video